Forget to record. <laughs> Forget to remind me. Okay, folks, welcome back. Beginning always with a little prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated. You shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Okay, so we are here in the course in um, bioethics in the program of uh, a master's in molecular and cell biology at St. Thomas University, moving along on the end of life issues. And uh, any questions or comments? All right. So we have covered a couple of principles already in the end of life. Uh, first, uh, the general distinction between assisting or substituting vital organs. Also, the issue of mm, killing or allowing to die, right? Ethically, that's a big radical distinction there. Not killing directly, uh, but allowing to die. Uh, in fact, uh, we need to allow people to die at some point. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not uh, good. Uh, but these principles will help us along. So today we're gonna to cover three more principles that are used quite a bit in bioethics. The sources of morality or the fonts of the moral act, the fonts of the moral act, three fonts. Then the principle of double effect, which is used quite a bit also. And then cooperation with evil. Formal cooperation, material cooperation, will make those, all those distinctions. So today's class is going to be a little bit more on the philosophical side, on the logical side. I don't think I have too many pictures or anything like that, but it's going to be more a thought process. And so I need you to follow along in the argument because it's, a, again, it's what I call an argument of logical consistency, right? If we are upholding the right to life of, uh, one group of people, and an argument of logical consistency argues for holding that right to life for another group of people also. Otherwise, it becomes subjective and arbitrary, right? That's why, mm, particularly, these uh, fonts of morality, the sources of morality, will allow us to do an objective bioethics, objective, mm, because we allow for the subjective, but we focus on the objective. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Okay, so we're gonna go through these three principles today. And then by Friday, we'll be applying at least one of them with ectopic pregnancy. So little preamble again, uh, because uh, I'm using what uh, is known as a Judeo-Christian tradition, Judeo-Christian anthropology, you know in anthropology, it's a what? What's an anthropology? The different types of anthropologies, right? Anthropologists are the ones who study what? The human. the human, exactly, the human, right? So typically anthropology study cultures and study uh, ancient civilizations and even primitive people and so forth, the cave people. So there is cultural anthropology that focuses on looking at the cultures uh, throughout time. How can we tell about cultures that have of uh, civilizations that have disappeared, like the Egyptians, the Romans, the Mesopotamians. <clears throat> but what they left behind, oh. right? Which is called material culture. So the stuff they leave behind, every culture leaves stuff behind. Typically at the time is considered trash or garbage. <laughs> and uh, then the anthropologists get into that and they study it. And they see, oh, these people made plastic, for example, and they make all kinds of things with plastic. <laughs> That's pretty. And then, yeah, they get into skits. What is skit? Skit is studying the defecation, the, the, the organic waste of cultures, all right? Skitology, it's a whole science called skitology. <laughs> they get into it. And like the mounds, the, uh, what do they call these Indian mounds? Mm. Yeah, it's like a little hill where they threw their shells and whatever they ate and bones and stuff, okay? Well, that is a real treasure for anthropologists to go through that and they can tell whatever they ate and uh, how they then from there, what they cultivated and so forth. It was a good season or a bad season that year. A lot 
it's a really neat investigative work. Mm -hmm. So an anthropology is a study of the human, and then there's theological anthropology, theological anthropology looking at the human from the perspective that we are also God's image, that God is in the picture, right? And if God is God, then has to be creator. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that makes us creatures uh, together with the rest of the universe. But unlike the rest of the universe, we believe that we are particular creatures and that we are God's image. So here's from the book of Genesis, as you can see the first chapter, and this is called the uh, Hebrew interlinear. You can find this online. It's really cool these websites where it gives you, you know, that the Old Testament is mostly written in, um, I'm talking about the, the Bible, 46 books in the Old Testament written in Hebrew or Aramaic, which is a derivative of Hebrew, Aramaic, and the New Testament uh, written in Greek, right? So they're both ancient languages. In fact, you would say, well, Greece today, they speak, Hebrew, they speak uh, Greek, but it's not the same. The, the Greek back then was called Koine Greek, Koine, and it's ancient Greek, it doesn't exist today, all right? It's like, for example, Shakespearean English, right? Who talks in Shakespearean English? Or Castilian Spanish, right? Uh, even though it is Spanish, English, but uh, it's old, old fashion for us. And the Hebrew also, the Hebrew has changed a little less, but even contemporary Hebrew more in the speech and the communication, the writing is the same because it's the same alphabet mm -hmm. or the same uh, pictograms or ideograms, which are these. So a couple of things about the Hebrew. This is the Hebrew interlinear of the entire Bible. And this is just one uh, verse from one chapter of one book, book of Genesis chapter one, verse 26, which is to the end. I think it has 27 or 28 verses in the first chapter. And it's that first chapter, by the way, which is kind of the most controversial with regards to evolution because talks about God creating the human, right? And there seems to be no evolution there. I do another course on uh, fundamental bioethics and we cover the process of evolution. And we look at the compatibility actually, at the level of detail of the biblical narrative of creation, the six days of creation, right? And the evolutionary process of about 13.8 billion years, but that's just to, to get to the current on earth, life itself, about 4 billion years, more or less, 3.8, 4 billion, right? And when we start looking at the detail, we actually see a lot of compatibility and complementarity. As long as we don't, we're not fundamentalists. What do I mean by fundamentalists? Fundamentalists is the people who interpret any book or any teaching literally, literally, whatever says, whatever the word says, the Bible, interpret it literally. So fundamentalists, when they read six days of creation, they're thinking six days of 24 hours. So as Catholics, we take exception to fundamentalism and we're not fundamentalists. We rather look at the deeper meaning of the passage, what we call in Latin sensus plenior. Sensus plenior is the plain, the fuller meaning of the passage, right? Fuller meaning. And um, I'm not going to go into it in depth, but just sticking with Genesis 1, for example, uh, uh, there's day one, which is light from darkness, separating light from darkness, and then, then day two, water from uh, land. And it's only on day three that God creates the luminaries, the larger luminary to illumine the day and the lesser luminary to illumine the night. What's he talking about? Or what's exactly the sun and the moon, right? So that's on day three. Now, what determines a day of 24 hours? Daylight or day or night, right? And how can we have day without a sun? <laughs> and so you see that if we're fundamentalists, there are internal contradictions in the Bible if we take it literally. Therefore, the alternative is not to interpret day as a 24 hour day, but rather as a period of time, as a set period of time. Now, that gives us uh, the opportunity to interpret those six days of creation and six moments, six evolutionary moments of the universe, the earth, life, and humans, okay? 
And then it fits beautifully because just staying with the big picture for now, you may know that of the six days, when is the human created? Six. On the sixth day, on the last day. And when we look at the evolutionary process of the anthropoids of Homo, the genus, right? Of which we are the only current species, but we know that there are other Homos in, in um, archaeology, in the fossil record, about five or six at least, anywhere from half a dozen to a dozen, depending how they're classified, species. They're all Homo genus and different species. Faber, Neanderthal, um, Erectus, etc. Okay? So, <clears throat> We look at the Homo, uh, emergence of the Homo, mm, anywhere between 200 to 2 million years ago, 200,000 to 2 million, uh, it's very recent in evolutionary time. Very recent. It's really the, one of the most recent species, certainly the most recent mammal that has arisen. And so it fits with the last day of creation, the most recent uh, evolutionary process. Okay, uh, I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle, just focusing on the creation of uh, the human here described in scripture, picking up with the theological anthropology. In other words, uh, taking the datum from anthropology, including the fossil record, and the fact that we exist materially, biologically, organically, right? Therefore, empirically can be measured. And also that we are body and soul one, so that we have a a metaphysical, we have physical reality and a metaphysical reality, which by belief, we believe will endure forever in eternal life. And uh, in that sense, we are God's image, right? So a uh, couple of uh, technicalities here. First of all, you know that uh, Greek, um, Hebrew, like many ancient languages, go from right to left. So we start here, here's uh, the, the right margin is the beginning and it's going this way. All right, and that's how to read it. So you have the ideograms in black. Then you have the translation, the syllabic translation of that in the, in the Hebrew above in blue. Um, then you have the English translation of that in, uh, what do you want to call that? Orange or brown, whatever. Okay, and then there's some mm, grammatical notation down here in blue again. And this is the verse 26, so it's going this way. And so it's kind of awkward to read after a while you get used to it. You start here with the little, think of it of uh, chunks or bites, right? And said, God, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock. All right, so that's how you read it. Um, so God is Elohim. There are several names to God. Yahweh is one that the Hebrews don't pronounce as such because it's the direct name of God and naming someone a little bit of, okay, so a little bit of grammar here also helps for the logic, for philosophy, because we're talking about the substance, something, the substance and the accidents, right? And we have a grammatical expression for that. In grammar, what do we call the substance of a plastic bottle, all right? Or a cell phone or a table. It's the noun, the noun, which grammatically it's also called the substantive, the substantive substantivo in Espanol, right? And so the noun is the substance of the thing. And then the adjective qualifies the noun, gives it color, shape, etc. Right? Okay, great. Question? So if you want to answer uh, it's about the pronunciation of Yahweh, uh, do you mm. think that's uh, do you think that's like uh, with the intended pronunciation of the Okay, so Yahweh is Right, the tetragrammaton, right. It's called the tetragrammaton because there are only vowels or as uh, consonants originally. This is what we're talking about. <laughs> All right. In original Hebrew, there was only vowels. And it was very harsh to pronounce because of a lot of raspy sounds. And so at some point, they just added a few vowels here and there, which are like comets and dots and periods. You see those here. 
all these little <clears throat> wiggles above and beyond and below, okay, that's what gives it uh, some kind of a vowel flow to it. But this is known as the tetragrammaphone because it has four letters. And according to the Hebrews, this is the direct name of God. And that's why I say the name is a substantive, which is the essence of the thing, philosophically speaking. And we're not allowed to know the essence of God because we're creatures. So for a strict observance Jews, they will not pronounce the tetragrammaphone, okay? So they need alternative names to address God. And so they use, they use um, attributes. So Lord, Almighty, and so forth. So that's where you get Elohim, Adonai, right? They are attributes of God, uh, uh, but not the direct name as such. So having said that, let's go back a little bit here. This one, they're using Elohim, okay? Which is, there are four fonts that come into the book of Genesis, and this is the Elohist font, and that's why I mentioned it. There's another font, the previous uh, font that is called the Yahwist font. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I want you to notice a couple of interesting things. Uh, Adam, well, this is actually from, if you look at Genesis 2, there's a second, there's a second, uh, uh, narrative of creation, of the creation of the human, right? God takes uh, mud, and from mud he molds Adam, and then Adam is alone, and then Adam, uh, God puts Adam to sleep temporarily, not euthanize Adam, right? He just created him, <laughs> and then takes out the rib and generates Eve after that, which Eve means of Adam, Eva. Uh, but basically, there's a plain word because in Hebrew, Adam, you can see the name here, Adam, and dirt or soil or mud is Adama. So Adam is made out of Adama, right? And there's a play on words there. And Job picks up on that, another book of the Old Testament he says, uh, we are ashes and to ashes we shall return or we are dust, we shall return to the soil. And it's kind of an, a, a reference to the fact that when we decompose, our nutrients go back to the soil, <laughs> just like any other organic material. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I'm diverging too much here. I want to focus in on the image. Let us make man in our image and likeness, image and likeness. All right, so I want to focus on these two attributes of the human image and likeness. And that's what we call imago Dei in the Latin, imago Dei, that we are God's image. What do we mean by that? We're God's image. Because for example, when I look at the mirror, I see an image of myself, right? But um, can I quantify that image on the mirror? We know it's flat, but at least I can measure the color, the size and so forth. So it's empirical, it's quant that image is empirical. However, is God empirical? Can we measure God? How much does God weigh, etc.? You know, how old is God? <laughs> how long is his beard? <laughs> so, uh, God is metaphysical, is not empirical, and we have an empirical component of us. So, in which way, how are we imaging God? How do we image God? You know, it's certainly not with our physical body, also because our body is made, it's uh, composite, right? It's made of parts, organs, tissues, cells, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, so we're made of parts all over the place. But God is uh, not made of parts. He is what we call simple, philosophically. Simple, not complex. Mm -hmm. And so simple is actually more complicated <laughs> because there are no parts, there are no parts to measure. How then are we imaging God well, we believe by two faculties specifically that we have, two faculties. And those two faculties are the intellect and the will. They belong to us, okay? And so it's, it's God's gift, if you will, because it also distinguishes us from the other 
species on Earth, at least the only place where we know life so far, organic life, and the closest species to us would be, yes, pantroglodytes, right? We have a skeleton <laughs> in the closet there <laughs> in the vitrine. And uh, pantroglodytes, uh, at least genetically, phylogenetically, is the closest to us, the chimpanzee. It's about 99% homology. 99% homology of 3 billion base pairs. That is amazing. <laughs> okay, we're so close. But like the French says, voila la petite différence. Oh, yeah. Thank God for that one percent difference because that, 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 we don't have to walk on our knuckles and, <laughs> and be living in the wild. We can be civilized <laughs> and have heat or now instead of air conditioning. <laughs> uh, so and it's the intellect and the will that separates us, especially abstract thought, okay? Because other animals think, obviously, if we approach an animal and they run away, that's a thought process, right? <laughs> and get away from this dangerous uh, creature that's approaching me. Mm, but abstract thought, as far as we know, uh, not even the chimp will do mathematics, you know, algebra or calculus or anything like that. <laughs> and you sit him in front of a typewriter, uh, he'll start playing with the typewriter. And by serendipity, over a few hundred thousand million years, he may write a book by whatever he's hitting. <laughs> but it's gonna, it can take a lot of trial and error. So there's really no abstract thought. And certainly uh, less the will, the volition, because they're locked into what? Instinct, instinct, all right? If they're hit by the hormones, they're gonna follow the hormones and uh, they're not gonna resist temptation. <laughs> and that's why we don't jail animals. We don't jail a lion when he takes down a zebra, you know, for killing a zebra. <laughs> the lion intentionally killed the zebra, it was not by <laughs> by mistake, hunted it down and killed it. So we don't jail them because they're innocent. They don't have a will. They have instinct and they have to live by the instinct. But we do. And so we believe that these two capacities particularly uh, make us that uh, are uh, that's image, okay? And so uh, like the little saying goes, God's uh, our life is God's gift to us because none of us has to be alive. What we do with our life, in other words, the intellect and the will, how we use it or misuse it, is our gift to God, right? So having that as background, now we can analyze the sources of morality or the sources of bioethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we have these three sources of bioethics. Okay, of uh, morality, of a moral act, of an ethical act. So an act that involves some kind of decision making between right and wrong. We can always break, break it down into these three components, even though we are breaking them down and separating them for the purpose of study, but they occur together simultaneously. All right, the moral object, the intention and the circumstances and they reside uh, differently. I'm gonna leave the moral object uh, for last for now, because it's the one that's a little more um, tricky to understand. I'm gonna focus on the intention. Is the intention objective or subjective? It's subjective, it belongs to the subject, it belongs to each one, the intention for the, the reason for which. So each one of these answers questions the intention answers the question, why? Why do we do what we do? You know, why do we behave or misbehave? <laughs> so the intention is subjective, belongs to the individual. I'll give you an example, charity. I may be giving money to someone who is needy, but I may do, be doing it out of generosity or I may be doing it to lower my tax bracket, or because I want other people to see me and to emulate me for being charitable, right? So what are the intentions? Nobody knows because it's inside the heart. It's inside. And so the intention is very personal, very subjective. And at the end of the day, really, there are only two people who know each one of our intentions, God and ourselves. <laughs> 
only we really know what we're thinking and what we're willing internally, and God, who we believe has access to everything, that's why he's God. So the intention is subjective. And that's why we say in Catholic morality, we never judge the intention of people because it's getting into their conscience. You know, who knows? And I can tell you also from being a priest for so many decades uh, that many people are misinformed and they have, they have good intentions, but they're misinformed and they act incorrectly. For example, a teenage girl who's pregnant and has swallowed the lie that it's not a real human being. What she's carrying is just a little bit of tissue, all right? And so she's gonna get rid of the tissue. And she actually believed that, that that's not really a human being that she has within her, okay? And so she's misinformed. But objectively, objectively, that abortion is objectively killing a human being. So how do we deal with that? Well, that's going to be the moral object. We'll get to it. But uh, the circumstances, just for following this kind of logic, answers the questions where, when, how, okay? The circumstances, was it done freely or was it done under duress, right? Some people do wrong things, but they're at gunpoint. They are being coerced into doing wrong things. So the circumstances uh, play big in judging whether an action is uh, correct or not, or, or whether the person is guilty or not. All right. So, and even in court, circumstances uh, can diminish, can go from first degree murder or second degree murder, manslaughter, which is lesser. So the circumstances certainly can influence mm, the decision making process. So we have that the intentions answer the question, why, why do we do things? But that's internal, that's on the conscience and we never judge the conscience of people. Uh, circumstances, how, when, where, all right? Now, the moral object is really what allows us to do an objective morality. An objective morality without having to judge the conscience, we can say objectively that some behaviors are right and some behaviors are wrong, right? And so they write the, the good behaviors should be encouraged and the bad behaviors should be discouraged and avoided because they are objectively wrong, independent of the good intentions and the circumstances. So this uh, moral object is crucial for allowing us to do what we call an objective morality, not be passing judgment on people, but the behavior itself, the action. Okay? So, this answers the question, what? What is being done objectively, all right? What is being done? But the what is a total what. It's not just a physical what. For example, two people in front of each other and one of them has a knife. And so uh, the one with the knife, let's say I'm the one with the knife and um, uh, killing the other person, okay? Now, that would be the moral object. I don't know why, I, uh, people don't know why I'm killing the other person, but I'm killing the other person. And uh, we have to understand that the moral object is not just inserting, it's not that my hand is inserting a sharp metal blade into the abdominal region of another person who's standing in front of me. It's not just a physical description. It has to have the ethical, moral quality also of killing, in other words, it implies that, uh, that I'm killing the other person. Now, I may be killing the other person, a couple of choices, right? It's either murder or self-defense. And what's the difference between the two? It's on the person being killed. The person being killed is either innocent or an unjust aggressor, you see? And so we have to see, and that's why the moral object is a little tricky. We have to see the big picture of the moral object, not just the physical thing, what is happening. So not just photographically, but we have to see what is happening in the bigger context, all right? In the fuller meaning of the action. And that's the moral object. So I'm killing the other person, but if I'm doing it in self-defense, that's justified, that's ethical. 
if I'm doing it as murder because the other person is not aggressing me, it's innocent, then that's murder, which is unethical. The same action. So it depends on the other person, you know, what the action is going to be, what is the ethical moral color of the action, whether it's ethical or not ethical. And that's what we call the moral object. I know it's a little abstract, but as we go through cases, then it comes out, all right? And for example, I can bring up a case that we saw a couple of weeks ago, a couple of lectures ago when we looked at uh, Brittany Maynard. So her intentions, we don't go there, we don't question, you know, she had good intentions, she didn't want to die from the cancer, from the brain cancer, but objectively, what did she do? She took a lethal dosage, objectively, you know, and no one was forcing her to take a lethal dosage. There were other people complicit in that action, but she's, who's the principal agent of that action? Herself, she's the principal agent. Other people were cooperating, all right? So objectively, she took a lethal dosage, which we can say objectively is a moral evil, is wrong, should not be done. You know, should we be taking lethal dosages? No. <laughs> Under what circumstance? Well, if it's going to kill us, in principle, under no circumstance. Right? So that allows us to do what we call an objective morality when we focus on the moral object to see the behavior itself, whether it's right or wrong. The alternative, so people may take exception to this, fine. And then what's going to happen with an argument of logical consistency is that if you follow the alternative argument to not have a moral object, just to, to eliminate the moral object, all right? And not, um, not consider it because you say, well, it's just a construct. Then we're left with situation ethics. And what's gonna happen is that sooner or later, we will not be able to distinguish between murder and uh, stealing and adultery and so forth, because everyone will have a good intention anyway. You know, they have the good intention of having more money, they have the good intention of having more pleasure, etc. And we will not be able to judge certain behaviors in society that should not be done <laughs> objectively for the common good, all right? Because we also have a right, for example, we have a right to private property, etc. And so people should not be stealing from us, right? Or should, we should not be stealing from other people either. There is a right to property. Mm -hmm. All right, so this allows us to maintain all that. And at the end of the day, really, it allows us to maintain civility and be able to live in society in a civilized way. Uh, this just goes through each one of them. Uh, so to review then, what's the question that this uh, moral abject answers? what the what what is being done right and why it's been done the intention the intentions could be good or bad but we don't want to pass judgment on that and then the circumstances all the other questions where when how okay and this can color and this can mitigate um for example when we get into vaccines we'll be using this because there is um uh, these vaccines were using the HEC line, the HEK, the I talk about the HEC line, the human embryonic kidney line that was developed way back. All right, so uh, we'll have a lecture on the, on the um, vaccines and the fact that some vaccines were developed by using embryonic tissue and did that embryo come from a procured abortion or come from a spontaneous abortion, which would make... Yes, yes. Oh, we've done interviews. We've done, uh, we did a webinar here in English and Spanish in Creole with the uh, School of Business to try to pump it out because people, some people don't want to vaccinate. They have qualms about that and they actually think that they're getting fetal cells into their bodies. <laughs> and so it's clean, right? We call it ethically clean or ethically tainted, right? But uh, that's what we're going to see this other principle of um, of cooperation with evil dovetail. 
but what I'm trying to say here is that the circumstances um, may mitigate um, something that for some people may be uh, more serious than others, for example. Oh, there's another aspect here also. I don't want to go too far afield, but there's something. Have you ever heard of uh, evaluative knowledge and speculative knowledge? This is in the field of nociology. Nociology is the study of knowledge <laughs> as such. Mm, so there is a palliative knowledge, oops, a speculative knowledge. Talk about the intellect, right? And what happens here is that Ethically, as, as uh, professionals, okay? Ethically, uh, we are held, we can be held accountable for some, for knowing some things. For you, a student, for example, we held you accountable for knowing what we're teaching. <laughs> and that's what we assess and so forth. Uh, but um, people can and are held accountable for knowledge or lack of knowledge. And some of that knowledge they need to have. You know, they're responsible for having that kind of knowledge, but other knowledge is speculative. So to give you a, a personal example, as a priest, I need to know about the sacraments. I need to know how to celebrate a mass. I need to know how to uh, hear a confession, etc., do a baptism. And so that's evaluative knowledge because that knowledge helps me to function professionally or whatever it is, my vocation or profession, etc. right? So we all have a certain amount of evaluative knowledge a body of knowledge that we need. For a medical doctor, you can see it very clearly. The engineer, they need to know the math, they need to know the, the calculus. For every profession has a body of knowledge that is necessary for exercising that profession. Beyond that, then there is speculative knowledge. There's knowledge that is out there, but it doesn't income any one of us. For example, I cannot be held accountable as a priest. I cannot be held accountable how a rocket functions or how do we get to Venus, all right? I may be interested in astronomy and be an astronomy buff and so forth and read about it, but I cannot be held accountable for knowledge in astronomy as a priest. But if I'm an astronomer, then that's a valid knowledge for me as an astronomer, uh, if I'm an astronomer and not a priest, then knowing about the sacraments is speculative. <laughs> so each field has its own body of uh, knowledge, right? So why am I saying this? Go back to the thing. Yeah. So in the circumstances, this comes in. Uh, professionals are held accountable for certain knowledge that they should have, but the general public is a different story. You cannot expect the general public to be competent on how vaccines are made and all this, you know, they're just here saying. That's why it's uh, dangerous, all the misinformation and all the conspiracy theories that got out there and the misinformation on the web, because people just don't know and they read it. And they were, were also a very gullible species. It's amazing, the human species, when you study the human species from a biological perspective, we're very violent <laughs> as a whole. Uh, we're very gullible, which is kind of paradoxical, okay? And we believe anything they tell us and without really um, confirming the sources. So what do they say? Check the sources, right? Check your sources because people, and so we need to think critically and that's to me one of the best advantages of going through college, you know, beyond high school, college itself is to help the students think critically, all right? And, um, and to see, well, is this person really saying the truth? Do they have the competency to talk about what they're talking about? All right, where's the evidence? All right, so that's with regards to the sources of morality. Like I say, these three occur simultaneously, but we split them up for the purpose of study. And we concentrate mostly on that moral object and then the circumstances surrounding the issue. For example, in the end of life issues that we're talking about, nutrition and hydration, uh, the circumstances would be patient per patient, patient by patient, you know, what are the comorbidities of this patient and so forth. 
another principle, cooperation. Cooperation with evil is a challenging one, but this means that, first of all, we're not the principal agent. You see, we're not the principal agent, but we are cooperating. And we're cooperating with an evil act. And what are the limits of cooperating with an evil act? Okay. So cooperation with evil, with an evil act, can be either formal or material. And material can be further divided into uh, immediate or immediate material, and then that can be further divided into proximate and remote. This is a little too technical, so we're not gonna get this far down, but at least this far, so these, we're not gonna see, but we're gonna see these. So let's look at them for a moment. Formal involves the will, okay? So a person is involved in an evil act. Let's say that there is uh, a robbery. So there's a principal agent, the mastermind, who's putting the whole robbery together. He or she may actually be at the site or not, or may be remote, but there are other people involved in the act, all right? So we say objectively stealing is wrong. A robbery objective because of moral object. And so it's an evil act. I'm not the principal agent, I'm not the mastermind who's putting the thing together, but I may be involved in the robbery, okay? How am I involved, formally or materially? And what is licit and what is illicit? So formal means that I, my will is engaged with the principal agent, with the will of the principal agent. In other words, I will the evil act. That's formal cooperation, is willing the same evil act so I want to steal also. Material is when I'm participating materially in the evil act, but I don't will it. So obviously I'm under duress of some sort, all right? I may be at gunpoint. So I may be the policeman or the security guard inside the bank and the robber has a gun to my head. So I, the security, I'm gonna go to the cashier to get the money. But the, the other guy has a gun to my head or pointing at me. And therefore, I am materially, I, the security guard, I don't want to steal, okay? So it's not formal cooperation. My will is not engaged, but materially, I have to do it to save my life. And therefore, mm, I go ahead with the act. I am cooperating with the robbery. I'm literally cooperating with the robbery, but I'm cooperating materially, not formally. Then, there's this further distinction, uh, immediate or immediate, it simply means how close I am to the evil act itself. So for example, but the closeness is not a physical closeness, it's what we call an ontological closeness, right? Ontological meaning in, in the whole picture of it, how directly, that's another word, direct or indirect. You can see these immediate is direct, immediate is indirectly involved. So uh, let's stick with the same example. The guard is cooperating materially with the robbery, but not formally because he doesn't want to steal. Is he immediate or immediate? Well, he's actually going over to the cashier and getting the money. So he's, he's pretty directly involved in that action. All right. So he would be in immediate material cooperation. Immediate would be, for example, let's say there are two guards, okay? And the other guard is uh, guarding the entrance and is supposed to sound an alarm, an alert if the police come. The other guard is also under gunshot or under uh, the gun, but the other guard is not directly getting the money. He is guarding the entrance. Again, he's in material cooperation because he's involved in the robbery. He's allowing the robbery to occur, right? Uh, however, he's not immediately direct, he's not directly involved in the taking of the money itself. He's guarding the entrance. Again, he's in material cooperation, not formal because he doesn't wish to rob the bank. In fact, he's there to protect the bank, right? But he also wants to save his life. 
So he's in material cooperation, but he's not directly involved. He's indirectly involved. So he would be in immediate material cooperation, right? The bottom line about all this, and you can see it can get pretty technical. The bottom line is between formal and material, really. This is the distinction, the ethical distinction here is the crucial one. Why? Because with formal, the will is actually engaged. I actually am willing, desiring the evil act. And that type of cooperation is unethical. It's unethical, all right? Whereas material cooperation, which typically involves some kind of duress, or it could be ignorance, then uh, can be done for a grave reason, for a serious reason. The serious reason, what's the serious reason of the guards? They're cooperating with the robbery, right? Stick with the, with the example. Yeah, risk of death, of being killed. So they have a serious reason for cooperating, but they're not willing it, okay? So very important. So material cooperation, the bottom line here is that material cooperation with evil, even a grave evil, is allowed for a serious reason. And that's what we'll see with the vaccine, that even if that cell line came from a procured abortion of a human embryo, the virus can kill me. And therefore, since I don't will the abortion that would have occurred already, then materially I take the, the vaccine because I'm not cooperating formally. But materially, yes, because I'm using the vaccine. However, the virus can kill me, so I have a serious reason for taking the vaccine. I gave you the lecture already. <laughs> All right, so these just go through the different parts again, one by one. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, a scandal, it's a further consideration, and this applies mostly to public figures or institutions that have a high visibility. So one thing is us, you know, private citizens that may be involved in cooperation with evil at some point, but who are the people we're going to scandalize? It's a rather limited circle of people, are mostly our close friends or relatives, whoever knows us. So it's a relative small circle of people who would be scandalized if we cooperate with evil uh, formally, okay? Or even materially. But public figures or institutions, it's a different story because they have a high profile, they have high visibility. And so in some circumstances, whereas material cooperation is allowed for individuals, institutions or public figures, even material cooperation is not allowed because of the perception and the potential for scandalizing a large number of people. An example I can give you with Catholic hospitals is that even material cooperation, for example, obviously they're not gonna do abortions, but even a referral to an abortion clinic. So a woman comes, she wants an abortion, she will not have it at a Catholic hospital. Well, how about you give me a referral then, where's the nearest clinic? Referring to the clinic right? It's not formal cooperation because the hospital is not doing the abortion, but it's material cooperation in that they're giving the, the woman some material information to procure the abortion. That could be scandalous if it gets out, that a Catholic hospital is giving referrals for abortion. It's kind of hypocritical, no? They don't do the abortions themselves, but they refer you to where they can get them. And so it's a higher standard for institutions. And I mentioned that because the ERDs are written for Catholic healthcare services institutions. So what you'll see there, the institutional standard is a little higher than at the level of the individual. And you'll see that in the section of beginning of life precisely, it will mention that even material cooperation with abortion or contraception of any of these evils that we talked about uh, is not allowed in Catholic institutions, okay? Even material cooperation which is a higher standard than at the level of individual private citizens. And a similar reasoning applies to public figures. 
So we have a big challenge today, frankly, it's in the news, I'm not revealing any secret of conscience, that because we are in this bipartisan system and one party is pro-life and the other one is pro-choice, we happen to have the second Catholic president in the United States, in the history of the United States, right, uh, Joe Biden, who is pro-choice and is going to communion and is scandalizing a lot of people by doing that. So there's a big debate in the Catholic community now, should Joe Biden be receiving Eucharist or not, because he's pro-choice, okay? Yeah, Kennedy, JFK was the first one, that's it. Even though we're about 23% of the population. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the second principle cooperation. Again, uh, subtle, refined. We need to think about it a little bit. Okay. But uh, these principles are very, very useful when we're looking at uh, evil actions and the limit of uh, cooperating with that, with that evil. Let's move forward now to the third one, which is going to be the principle of double effect. Okay, this one is also a very useful principle in bioethics and medical ethics, and uh, you'll see it around. Double effect is when you have two effects simultaneously from a single action. So it's very important to be clear from the onset. The word double is a reference to two, okay? Two effects, two outcomes from a single action. One that's good and one that's bad, okay? How, uh, how are we able to justify being involved in that action if beyond the good effect, there's also an evil effect? Like in the example of a topic pregnancy that we'll see next, uh, this coming Friday. All right, so we want to heal the woman from a, a life-threatening situation, but the embryo is going to die in the process. So we have two simultaneous effects, one that's good, one that's bad, ethically speaking. How do we deal with that? Well, we deal with, it with this principle of double effect. The principle of double effects tells us that we are ethically, that we can participate in actions that have a good effect and a bad effect simultaneously, as long as these four or five conditions are met. As long as these four or five conditions are met. Okay. I'm gonna start with the last one first because that's why I put it in parentheses. People, when you look at principle double effect, typically you'll see four conditions. But the fifth one is so obvious that it's seldom stated. And we're talking about that this is the last resort. In other words, that there is no other protocol or procedure available. And so it's the last resort. Again, the topic pregnancy will be very, very uh, succinct or a uh, cancerous uterus, for example. Okay. What to do? So it's the last one. If there was another action that was not, that did not have the two effects, then we would choose that one because there would only be a good outcome, right? But this is last resort. Okay, so given that, the other four are here. So one by one, the act itself must be morally good or neutral. In other words, it's not an intrinsic evil. It's not an intrinsic evil. The act itself, the moral object is good or neutral. However, the effect is dual. Good effect and bad effect, okay? So the action itself must be morally good or neutral. Secondly, the, this regards the will of the two outcomes, right? Only the good outcome should be desired or willed. The evil outcome, we don't desire it directly, but we tolerate it. It's a little bit like we talk about the two wills of God. Why does evil exist anyway? You know, why in some places uh, it's a hurricane and it kills hundreds of people and there's an earthquake, uh, there's a volcano and destroys the whole city. Why does evil exist? When we talk about the two wills of God. What God wills directly is 
and good whenever there is good. What God doesn't will directly but tolerates is the bad things that do happen. <laughs> and typically, if we follow that logic also, we think, why does God allow bad things to happen? Uh, we can always usually reverse the question and say, why do we allow bad things to happen? Take, you've heard of the San Andreas Fault, right? San Andreas Fault in California, that uh, plays, uh, they talk about it's gonna fall into the ocean, especially a piece of California. Just because it's in my mind, I talked about uh, earthquakes. And this. <laughs> okay, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> it's a fault. And it's on the coastline. And it's also uh, populated. Through those cities, right through San Francisco, San Palo Alto, San Jose, California. Okay. All these little towns here. Palm Bay, Palmdale, yeah, Palmdale. Look at all the towns along the San Andreas Fault. So we know that's an active, that's the Pacific Rim, that's part of the Pacific Plate, uh, rubbing with the North Atlantic Plate on plate tectonics, continental drift. Okay. And it's uh, quaking, it's pretty, pretty evident, pretty severe. These are actual photos. Hmm. So why do people live there? And why does the state of California allow people to live there? If we know that that's an active region of earthquakes, all right, and no matter how strong you make a building, sooner or later that building right on that fault is gonna crack and collapse. So why does God allow an earthquake to happen in the middle of San Francisco? Well, we can say, why do we allow people to live in the middle, on top of the fault? <laughs> anyway, so the uh, evil effect should not be willed, that, that, uh, because then that would be formal cooperation. The good effect must not flow directly from the evil effect. It has to be, it's important that the, it's kind of redundant in the sense that the principal double effect, the two effects occur simultaneously, but not sequentially, all right? If, there is, if they occur sequentially, the evil effect should not flow from the good effect. Because then we have a sequence, it, it contaminates, it taints. The, the good effect, all right? So if they flow simultaneously, that's fine. But what the, the good effect was not be dependent on the evil effect to occur first. And finally, proportionality. Proportionality is very important because it has to be something serious. Again, you'll see it with ectopic pregnancy, but basically is life for life, you know, it's not just cosmetic or something like that, but it is something serious with health or, or life, and that's proportionality. Uh, in other words, we don't go at a fly with a sledgehammer. <laughs> we use a fly or a uh, swat, okay? A fly swat. So proportionality is very important that there's due proportion. The difficulty, not the difficulty, but what's happening with proportionality is that in the minds of some people, proportionality was so strong that it became the overarching principle. And then that is called proportionalism, but the ism is an exaggeration, all right? Just like fundamentalism is an exaggeration. And so proportionalism is too much. It's excluding all the others, all the other uh, conditions, and just seeing proportionality. If there's proportionality between the two actions, then that's justified. And they forget about the will, the fact that it has to be, they cannot will the evil and so forth. So be aware that there's something called proportionalism in bioethics that is an exaggeration. You know, it's just taking the proportionality as the only principle, as the only parameter or condition to be satisfied. 
a derivative of proportionalism has been also consequentialism. All of these finish with uh, ism, consequentialism, which is if the consequences are good, then go for it. So you see how we slip into the end justifies the means, right? Consequentialism. If the consequences are good, then that's the only thing that counts. And therefore, just do it, right? But no, proportionality, we have to understand it in the proper sense that uh, it's uh, life for life or something like that. Questions? All right, so these are basically the three principles, right? These are a few references there at the end. Some, um, this one is more on the philosophical. These three are more philosophical. The catechism is more pastoral. The part three, which is the part on ethics or on morality in the church catechism. And then the ERDs that you're familiar with in the current edition. Mm. All these are online, by the way, for free in whatever language you want. So you have some references available if you want to at some point explain this to family or friends, some issues sooner or later with life, issues will come up. So you people are becoming experts in bioethics, okay? And uh, some people may be consulting you, asking you about this and that. For example, now when we look at the lecture on vaccine, hopefully it will be helpful for other people you may know if they have not been vaccinated yet, if they have some qualms or questions or doubts, that you'll be a resource person for them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some members of our family are be sending the motion to our members. Oh, yes, right. <laughs> yes. Bill Gates. It really is. It really is, unfortunately. But you know, see, gullible. How can we get a microchip into our bodies? And, and Bill Gates is going to be tracking us. You think he cares about that? Eight billion people? He doesn't need that. He has exactly. He's tracking us already. <laughs> yes. That's the, that's the challenge there. Because in my, I'll tell you what I think has been happening. Because I've spent now close to seven decades on this earth, beginning in the middle of the 1900s up until today. And what I've seen is the level of complexity getting bigger and bigger. The questions get more complicated, all right, and more mixed. And so it's harder to tell right from wrong, good from evil, and people get confused. And sometimes it gets a little too sophisticated, like IVF. I mean, who would say IVF looks like a great thing, very pro-life, right? This couple can't have children, geez. But it's in the detail. <laughs> it's in the detail, and people get lost in the detail. They're not able to follow, or it just takes too many ATPs, and they get tired, and they, they dump it. Because <laughs> hmm? uh, it's getting harder and harder to think. That's why I started saying this lecture is going to be a little more philosophical. Logic needs to kick in, and we need to reflect. We need to follow through an argument on logical consistency. Otherwise, when we ditch, logic, philosophy, reasoning, what kicks in? What's the next level? If we ditch reasoning, what's in the background always is emotions. Emotions, sentiment, passions, feelings. You know, but those are, there just are. Why some people are more affectionate than others? You know, that's, that's just emotions, passions, feelings, sentiments. We don't judge those, we don't question those. All right, but they're, by definition, they're not logical, they're not rational behavior, okay? And so that's the danger when we get, it. there has to be a balance between our feelings and our logic, our sentiments and our reason. Otherwise, if it's all sentimental, you know, we'd be either laughing or crying <laughs> or in euphoria or in depression all the time. <laughs> we just can't be going like a roller coaster because it burns us up. So reason kind of levels the playing field and we can talk reasonably with different cultures about issues and so forth. Okay. And so there has to be that balance and that to me is what wisdom truly is, is the proper balance, the proper mix between reason and feelings, right? 
reason and emotions, find a healthy balance, a mature balance within those, that to me is really wisdom. So it's not the same as intelligence. We all know some people who may be very intelligent, but they're not very wise. They make stupid decisions. And I know some people who are not too intelligent, but they're very wise because they have the wisdom of time. Typically, older people tend to be more wise about things. They may not have a big education, all right, or college degree or anything, but they're very wise about life. And they may not be too intelligent or intellectual, but they're people who are wise <laughs> because they have, uh, uh, they have acquired that over a long period of time. And it does take time. And time, we are out of. <laughs> well, actually, I got a few more minutes, but uh, I'm done. So any questions? Nothing? Good, another, everybody crystal clear. I can't believe I'm always so clear. <laughs> all right, good. So, all right, so you have these principles, you know, they're the intellectual tools that we use in making this life uh, threatening decisions and uh, decisions between life and death. So we'll be applying this. I keep talking about uh, Friday, I think is on, on uh, ectopic pregnancy. So you see that we'll be shifting back to beginning of life a little bit, but actually what we're doing now is we're shifting to our healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at ectopic pregnancy more from the health of the mother as such, which is certainly already born. <laughs> mm -hmm. And therefore we're going into that third sector. It's not all beginning of life. It's not all end of life. It's in the middle of life. So we'll look at issues like uh, the topic pregnancy, we'll look at uh, transgenderism, we'll look at uh, organ transplants and the COVID uh, phenomenon. All right, super, thanks a lot. See you Friday and if uh, ever you're inspired to do some work in the forest during the summertime, feel free to come Monday through Friday, nine to 12. Uh, make sure that uh, you're going to get some exercise out there. <laughs> okay. All the best, everybody. The virtual students. You guys okay? Still there? Yeah, we're good. Pretty good? Okay, super. Thanks. See you Friday.